Welcome to Old Path and our study through the book of Ephesians. Um, we're going to pick up at verse 22 and we'll run through the first nine verses of chapter 6. And um, so chapter 5, verse 22 through <laughs> through chapter 6, verse 9. Um, you can probably hear it in my voice. I don't know if you uh, had a chance to watch the video uh, that we put up yesterday. It was two days late uh, going through the Old Testament. But in that one, you would have heard my voice kind of messed up as well. If this is new to you, um, my wife and I have made it through COVID. And um, it was a, a, a week ago today that I first contracted it or knew that I had it. And uh, we are doing very, very well. We followed a, um, a, a COVID protocol and uh, the medications that we took. Uh, we're not the traditional ones like you you might hear. Uh, we took the ones that they're always making fun of, and they worked fantastic. So we are very much uh, on the mend, except for my voice and a little bit of residual congestion and some fatigue, but uh, pretty remarkable how fast we were able to get uh, past this less than a week. And so thank God, and uh, I know some of you were praying, and I'm thankful for that. But we're going to pick up uh, in Ephesians and... Um, Hopefully I won't have too much trouble with my voice. I have some water here. I'm going to have to be sipping at it quite a bit. I had um, a real tough time about halfway through the study yesterday. So let's see if I get through this one. Now, before we, um, before we get to uh, the actual text, there are some things that are important for us to recognize in what's, uh, what's being presented here to us. And it's good to remember. And I think I say this often enough, but whenever we're reading anything that's in the text, whatever's in the Bible that's in front of us, um, remembering all of it is very ancient as we would understand it. So the most current of the writings are basically, you know, 2,000 years old, 19 and some change. So when something is written, especially in Paul's epistles to the churches, there is no problem applying the, the, uh, the things that he is saying to the churches there at the time to our modern times. But we also need to remember that, uh, at least as far as we're concerned, our culture, where our churches may be, whatever freedoms we may have, whatever was the prevailing way of things in the world at the time is not necessarily like it is with us. So I want to try to make sure that we're very careful to put both things as they should be. How would this have meaning to the church at Ephesus? Because it, it seems like an odd kind of a letter that might be written to a modern church. Now, there would be changes in the language and even in the circumstances because of customs and things like that. And again, the prevailing way things were done in the world at the time. But the principle remains. And so in the application part of that, we'll make sure that we do that. So with all of that said, uh, last week, if you remember the last verse that we looked at in verse 22, where he says that we're to submit to one another inside the church in the most broad of senses. So among the brothers and sisters, the idea of being submissive to them isn't a matter of rank or hierarchy within the church. It's rather giving respect to the person that is right there in front of you because they are who God has made them to be. So you don't get in the way of what God is doing in them. You submit to them, and which is a way of saying, this is what God has made you into. I'm not going to get in the way of it. Let you know. Let the Lord lead you as he's raised you up. I don't want to get in the way of you fulfilling your, your call to serve him in the capacity that he's called you. That's what it's really about. So with that being said, that same thing carries over into the first couple of verses of um, what we're looking at today, starting at verse 22. He turns it towards the marriage uh, relationship. He will then turn it towards parents with children. He will then turn it towards the obligation that people have towards the, the people who, in our modern day, we would say employ them. But here are the people that are servants in the households of, of uh, people who, um, who they serve. And so it really is that part of the, the practical teaching within the book that Paul would say, since you are these believers, here's how you're to conduct yourself. And that's the part of the book that we find ourselves in. Very important to remember again, context is always king in our understanding of the scriptures. And then we make proper application based on our understanding of the text. So we're looking at Ephesus. We are very much in the pagan Roman world of modern day Western Turkey. So what would be acceptable in, say, the 21st century 
is different culturally in America than it would have been. The whole culture and everything about that the Roman world at the time was so different than ours. So it would it would be such a difference in just day to day life for the believer once they come to know Jesus because they're leaving a culture that is so antithetical to everything that a Christian would would want to do and want to present. So it's really kind of a relearning of everything that they're supposed to be doing. Many of us, the older that we are in the Lord, realize to some extent just what we're expected to leave behind because of who the Lord has become to us and how he's revealed himself to us and how his word reveals things about our hearts and our demeanor and how we're supposed to conduct ourselves and what's acceptable. So I completely understand this, though I can't entirely envision the world in which Paul is, is uh, ministering and where he's doing his ministry, where he's writing. It's, it's just almost impossible to really fully get your mind around what that world would have looked like. So with all of that as the background, we'll pick up at verse 22 today and uh, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you as we come to your word. We pray that you would open our hearts and minds to what we see and what we read, and that um, we would be attentive to the leading of your spirit, that we would understand what is being said and why it's important. So we thank you, and we pray, God, that you would uh, bless the, the time that we have together and that your Holy Spirit would open our eyes to this understanding of your word. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. <coughs> Sorry about that. I'm going to try not to do that too much today. All right. In verse 22, we get to one of those passages that is so, so horribly misunderstood. And I, I kind of alluded a little bit to it last week, but I'll mention it again. Now, verse 22 says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife. He is also, the um, as also rather, Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, because of that, just as the church is subject, same word is submissive. So it's, it's not a change in words. It's just a change in the English, same Greek. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so then let the wives be to their own husbands in all things. So it's just an opening statement. And the problem that we get with this, so oftentimes when people read that, if it's, so I, and I've, I've sat in rooms with people who have a real problem with this text, I will see the wives that, that become defiant about this because they think it says something and they're you know not, not inclined to do what it says here. I also see the husbands who use it as a way of saying, well, she's supposed to submit to me as though you've got some kind of great authority over her. If we understand what was said in verse 21, it settles that whole thing and then it shows that both of them are wrong. Because if we're supposed to be submissive, as I had said, verse 21, among in the church, Every person in the church has their function. God has gifted and raised up people to do all these different things. The last thing that we, as somebody from the outside, should do is get in the way of that, because then we start being the Holy Spirit. We start exerting our, whatever perceived power it might be, and we start getting in the way, and we're upturning the thing that God wants to do in them. Never want to be in that place, of course. So, with that being said, that same understanding for the word submit, hupatasso, <clears throat> is that we want to um, just get out of the way, let people be who they're supposed to be. Here's our key verse in this in understanding, verse 23. The husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. And if this was fully understood by both sides when they hear this, it would be a lot easier for them to flow with the rest of the passage. And really, Paul doesn't just leave it at this. He explains this in detail. But people need to get out of their own heads and just hear what he's trying to say to them. Now, he's going to explain that in, in the family, there would be what would be considered the head. And in the church, it's the same way. We never rebel against that. Jesus is the head of the church. We don't try to take his place. Of course not. That's his position. And he has that place of absolute, ultimate, total authority. We're just mortal. He's the creator God who loves us. So it's not difficult for us to do that and, and to understand it. At the same time, there's that order that is put in place. And so in the family kind of a thing, and the way I try to explain it when I, I use this passage, obviously, when I'm doing premarital counseling, when I used to do weddings. And I would say it this way, look, 
if something is wrong in the household, God's going to want to come to hold someone accountable. And he's put the husband in that place. And Paul's going to trace it all the way back to Adam and Eve. So what he has done, God has put in place the husband to be, when something's going on, the husband's going to have to answer for the well-being of the family. He's the head of that family. He's the covering for them. And so, you know, when when those roles get reversed, I've had to counsel with people like that. There's always a problem in the house when the husband bows out of his position and puts his wife in the place of having to do things that he should be doing. And if that error is on his side, he needs the correction of the Lord for letting it get to that point. If the wife wants to assert herself and wants to push her husband out of the way, she's equally as out of order. So who am I to say that? No one. Paul's the one who says it. Well, who's Paul to say it? He gives all of the biblical reasons for it. It's already been established long before. It's always been that way. That doesn't mean that it's good for abuses to take place. And God wouldn't accept such things. And again, Paul's going to give just practical examples of how this can be taken out of order and not done correctly. So with verse 23 as being kind of a nice commentary on it, let's read the three together. Verses 22 to 24, wives, submit to your husbands. Let him be who God's asked him to be. Who is that? The head of the household. Let him be that person as to the Lord. So if a wife is saying, well, how submissive do I need to be? Paul says, well, if you have no problem submitting to the Lord, then have no problem submitting to your your husband. And in premarital counseling, I love to chuckle about this and say, if a wife would say, but you don't know him, then I would say, Okay, well, if you have any concerns, you shouldn't marry him. If he can't lead as the Lord leads and you can't in good conscience say he hears the Lord's voice and he will follow him and he'll be a good head to our family, why would you not want that? But if he can't be that person, why would you want to marry him? So as to the Lord, it doesn't mean that you keep your eyes on whatever failings there might be. Get those things settled before you get married. But at that point, afterwards, as you follow the Lord, you also follow the the head of your household, your husband. But you're on equal footing. It doesn't make you any kind of a lesser citizen as far as that's concerned. So again, in the culture of the time of, of Rome here, think about husbands and wives' roles and the family dynamics. They were so different than what's being put forth here. So remember, what's being said, we can make application to our day, But Paul's writing this to a very much Roman citizen. So he says, now why is that? Why would you submit to him? Because the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. So those two things there. If a person, man or woman, looks at this and says, well, I don't agree with that, we have a much bigger problem than whether or not you would live this out. If you're going to start to pick and choose what you do and don't like and therefore be, you know, subject to what's in the text because you don't like it, then you start to say, I know better or I have better understanding than what the Bible puts out. I hope that you can see the danger in that if you're struggling with any of this. So Paul's going to begin to start to work within the the, the family dynamics of this, especially the husband's responsibilities, because it is not small. If you read the first two verses here, three verses actually, oftentimes women think, well, we get the short end of the stick. I would, in premarital counseling, always want to be sure that the man realizes you have the greater responsibility in this because the the wife is supposed to be looking to you as the head of the household, as Jesus is the head of the church. So do you act anything like your head, husband's? So your wives would want to have the confidence that to know that if God is asking you to lead and head up something, they have to have the confidence in you that you're hearing from him and doing according to his will. Because if not, then you're going to be a horrible husband. Hope that doesn't offend anybody, but if it does, that's not on me. Verse 23, uh, 4. Therefore, now because of that, just as Jesus, uh, just as the church rather is subject to Jesus, so then let the wives be to their own husbands. Subject, submissive, same word. So it's just saying if you can if you can do this with the Lord, then also know that the Lord is working in that man and should be. And if wives, you look at this and say, yeah, but my husband really isn't the way he's supposed to be. He's not doing those things. Then I would ask, do you pray for him? 
And husbands, if you have wives that have a difficult time with allowing you to be the head of your family and are always at odds with your decisions and, and they should be joint decisions anyway. But if there's always that friction because you feel that she's you know, wanting to usurp the whatever God, authority God's put to you, how often do you pray for her? How often do the two of you get together and look at a passage like this? How often do you pray through these things? Because really what should be happening is both parties, as they look through this, husbands and wives, should look through this entire verse here and just go, my, my default cannot be to look at any failings in my husband or my wife. I've got to first of all make sure that I have no offense in this. And if people had that approach to it rather than what are they not doing, things may be better. Now, Paul goes through and gives a lot of really good practical stuff that makes you go, okay, I get it. I understand. So then verse 25. So husbands. Now notice, he started with wives. Wives, allow your husband to be the person that God's put him there to be. Well, what is that? The head of your house. Well, who gave him that authority? Well, just as Jesus is the head of the church. So he's put that person in place. So therefore, because of that, then be submissive to that. Let him be that person. That's verse 24. So, husbands, here's what you're supposed to do. Love your wives, and then you might say, because it goes right back, it's, it's kind of a parallel to verse 22, when it says, wives, submit to your own husbands. Well, how much? As unto the Lord. So verse 25, husbands, love your wives. How much? Just as Jesus loved the church, and he gave himself for her. So husbands, is there strife? Is there problems in your marriage? And... Do you find that there is internal dynamics within your marriage that are all kinds of problems? Then I would flat out ask you to take a look at 25 and see how you're doing with that. Do you love your wives to the point that Jesus loved the church where he was willing to sacrifice himself for her? Does she know that? And is there ever a question in that? Or are you just the authoritarian that says, you have to submit to me because you've never studied it correctly? Heavy stuff. Guys should be paying real close attention to this. So it says that he loves her and gave himself for her. So again, those important questions. Of course, this means the same thing to the Ephesians as it does to ours, uh, our times rather. So husbands, there is a measure of love that you're supposed to have for your wife. Does your wife ever question whether or not Jesus loves her? Never. Not if she understands the scripture. Would she ever have a question of how much you love her? And if there's a difference in those two answers, then that is a problem. And husband, you the head of the family, you're going to have to give an account for why that is. Because you're supposed to answer to Jesus, the head of the church, because he's left you as the head of the house. So if there's a, a breakdown in this, don't blame your wife. Now, you've, you've got to take care of it and make sure that you are absolutely hands clean in this. And then you bring her to that place of realizing how much she is cared for and loved. Now, if that is being done, just these little bits that we've looked at here, if that's the relationship, a wife would be able to say, I'm going to allow my husband to be the head of the household, just as the Lord is the head of the church, and I'm not going to get in the way of that. I've got enough on my own plate is what that should really actually be. And the husband, same thing. I'm going to love the Lord, and I'm going to love my wife as he loves us. And so he gave himself for the church. I will give myself for my wife. Neither one becomes another's servant and, you know, not a reciprocal kind of thing. I want to serve my wife. What can I do to, to make her life better? And I wish I thought of that more often than I do. But there's nobody that's perfect in this. But boy, it should be a change of mind and how you handle things than when you first got saved. So husbands, do you do that? And if not, and if there is problems in the family, just know that the Lord is going to look to you to find out and get answers. Why are things out of order? It's going to begin with you, men. Husbands, love your wives. How much? As much as Jesus loved the church and gave himself for her. If that's what she sees in you all the time, you've just made her, her part of this, verses 22 and 23, very easy for her to do. It's easy for her to follow the Lord because the Lord loves her and gave himself for her. It's easy for the husband or for the wife to look at the husband and say, God's put him in the place of being the head of our family, but he loves me and he loves our kids if we have family, if you have children rather. But he loves the Lord first of all because of that he loves me and he leads as he's supposed to lead. Everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing. There's unity in the family and there is great success. So verse 26, here's why he does this that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. And there's a lot of 
you know, different views of what this ultimately means. I've always been comforted in saying if we want to keep looking for how the Lord ministers to us, there are those times that we, his bride, are in need of, of recognition, of the needing for him to see, which he always does. But he sees our, our weaknesses, our troubles, our failings, those things that a loving husband would do. And he sees to us his bride. And the, the most comforting way that God ever really ministers to us is to remind us whether it's just through the Holy Spirit of what the Word has to say about our troubles and helps to settle our minds. Sometimes it's like being taken directly to the Word in our devotional times and things like that. And there are things that He will bring up as we read through the Word that just really minister to the heart. There's no reason why a husband here and now cannot do the same thing. And so that ministering to the wife whether it's sitting down and opening the Bible, whether it's ministering to her because of what the Word has to say, however that may be, there's no cookie-cutter way that Jesus doesn't sit us down at a table and says, here, now open your Bibles, you've got to do this. Though that's entirely possible. But we, we rely upon the, the leading of the Lord and how He is going to minister to us in our time of need. So because of that, that he would be able to present her to himself, a glorious church that has no spot, no wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So the the best way for the church to be in a, a place of, of rightness as far as he's concerned and having our, our hearts and our minds in the, in the place that they're supposed to be is to have that constant exposure to the word. It will tell us about who we are tell us about who he is, gives us direction for the things that we're supposed to do. And ultimately what God wants to do, the more that we're exposed to the word and as he ministers to us, if we don't get so tied up with all the worldly things that fight against it, he can then present us what he shows to the world and to the Father is a, a church that doesn't have the wrinkle and the spot and the blemish. They've been cleansed, they've been encouraged, they've been strengthened, they've been protected because of what's in the word. So, Husbands, verse 28, you ought to love your own wives as your own bodies, because he who loves his wife loves himself. So now this starts to get to the unity of the, of the marriage relationship. So I love to point this out to the guys. When we get up in the morning, let me read the rest of it. Um, verse 29, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it, cherishes it, just as the Lord does for the church. So in verses 28 and 29, it's a great visual, though you may not actually see it at first glance, but I always love to talk to the guys about this because husbands, again, here's the thing. You need to realize that the two become one flesh, and he mentions that from Genesis 2, all the way back to Adam and Eve. And so if that's the case, I ask the guys, hey guys, when you get up in the morning, if you're the type that, you know, before you go to work or do whatever you do, do you shower, do you shave, you know, brush your teeth, do all that stuff, put on deodorant? And of course, the answer is always yes, whether they do or not. <laughs> The answer is always yes. Okay, great. So do you, when you shower, do you wash half of your scalp, your hair? Um, do you brush half of your teeth? Do you shave half of your face? Do you put deodorant under one arm but not the other? And of course, the answer to that is absurd. You'd have to go out of your way to neglect half of your body. And so if that's the case, same situation here. Do you have the same care for your wife and for her well-being in the day-to-day -day of things as you do for yourself. It's a big, big matter. It's a huge deal. And so as a result of that, there becomes problems oftentimes in the marriage if a husband is so keyed in on his own things and his wife becomes an afterthought, sometimes even less than an afterthought. So Paul would say, see how out of order that is? See how hard it is for your wife to let you be the person that you're supposed to be when you're not even that person? How is it that, that the, the marriage is supposed to stay in a place of, of healthiness when the husband can't even keep half of his obligation, and that is to his wife first and foremost? Guys, you may be hearing this, and maybe some of you are even mad as you hear this. That's too bad. You're just going to have to get over that because ultimately... God's not concerned whether or not you like this or you feel that your wife reciprocates. That's not your business. Your business is to make sure that you love her as she is supposed to be loved. And if she's got some kind of a crisis, again, I'll, I'll bring you back to this. Do you pray for her? And do you seek that you would um, um, be that, that example to her that she's supposed to be? Because that's really all that you're ever supposed to do. 
Make sure that your own house is clean and that your hands are clean and that you're doing your obligation before you worry about anybody else. So this is about, again, order within the family, but it begins with the husband. So the question again, but my wife's not doing what she's supposed to do. Well, that, that doesn't mean you withhold anything because you don't like how it's being done on the other side. You've got to take care of yours and make sure that your hands are clean and then entrust her to the Lord that she would see that. You're fine to go ahead and mention it to her and to say, I've looked through everything that I'm supposed to do. I don't see that I have any kind of failings here and then try to work through it because you have a great template in this in these verses here. They're not easy to hear. They're not easy to do. But it, it just means that, again, husbands, quit being defensive if, if you don't like the way that things are going. And wives, same exact thing. You don't withhold your responsibility in the marriage just because you don't feel that your husband or your wife is holding up their end of the bargain. You have to be right where you are, praying for your partner, your husband, your wife, and do what you're supposed to do because he is called man and woman to be married and the two will become one flesh. He uses that exact thing here. Look at what he says. For we are all members of his body. See, there's first and foremost our obligation. Our obligation is to our husbands or wives. But then first and foremost, that's a secondary issue because our, our primary is the Lord. And if we have our lives right with the Lord, then we don't have a problem with our spouses eventually. So I have seen a lot of people who have gone through divorces or they're going through very, very difficult times in marriage and the sad thing about it is that they have been, these are people who have genuinely withheld um, their own responsibilities. They haven't grown as they are supposed to in the Lord, and then it becomes a, kind of the friction thing in the family. Here's what I haven't seen. I have not seen people in front of me for counseling who are both absolutely 100% dialed in with the Lord, in fellowship with him, in his word, walking rightly, that are having marital problems. that I just have never run into that. Now, why is that? Because if you're following the Lord and he's got hold of your heart, the things that end up damaging marriages don't happen. And people can disagree with me on that all the time. I can only go by the, the experience that I've had of meeting with married couples for decades. And if the people in the marriage look to the Lord first and foremost, as he is my, I'm, I'm obliged because of my thankfulness to him for dying for me and giving his life for me. Because of that, I am absolutely sold out to him. I will be sold out to my marriage as well. And you'll be doing the things that are here. You don't need to be told to do that. The Holy Spirit directs you to this. So with all of that said, he says, for we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. <clears throat> now, because of this, for this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother be joined to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So this is Genesis right after Paul says to um, Paul. This is Genesis right after uh, Adam when he sees Eve and he calls her woman from man. Woman is, means from man. And he says, she's flesh of my flesh. She's bone of my bones. He realizes where she's been, where she's come from and that her very creation was taken from him. And he sees her as unique in all of human history and in all of God's creation, she's the one thing that was made from what already existed. God made everything else from the dust of the ground unique. It was only, you know, it was raw material. When it comes to Eve, she was taken from her husband and created that way so that the two would become one flesh. So the intimacy of this, it goes beyond really our, our English uh, words in order to truly, truly, fully understand. So when when Adam says she is genuinely bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, she's the one part of creation that was made from something that that was already existing, and that there's just no way to over as or overstate how important that is. So because of that, it's Moses who comments and says, now for this reason. A man will leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. They will become their own entity and their own authority. They're no longer the child under their parents. Now, <clears throat> traditionally through history, especially Old Testament history, there was nothing unusual about a family living in a compound. So all the family members would still be present very close to one another, very common, but it didn't mean that they were 
still just one group of people under one authority. Each household was its own authority. That's what God had raised up. And that's what he wants us to understand. So Paul says, and this is the essence. This is the great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and his church. So really there becomes the focus. Is it about the husband and wife's relationship? Is that the whole upshot of this? Yeah, it is. But most importantly, he says, but it's really patterned after a mystery. And it's a mystery that's now revealed. If you had tried to explain to an Old Testament saint that Jesus has a relationship with his church, much as a husband has with the wife, that idea of a head and one who leads a family, a church in this case, that would have seemed absurd to them. So it was a mystery. In the New Testament, it's all that we know. It's all that we've ever known. So it's all that we've ever known as his collective body of believers. And as husbands and wives in a Christian home, it's all that we've ever known about how order is supposed to be. Now, in case there's still confusion, people still have trouble with this, here's what Paul says. Let me wrap this all up. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. If you want to know what verses 22 to 24 cover for your wives, right there it is. Husbands, if you want to know what happens from verses 25 on when it talks about taking care of yourself and of your wife, right there is where it is. Husbands, love your wives. You have the perfect example in Jesus and how he loves the church. Wives, let your husband be who God's raised him up to be to the same measure that you have respect for his position as you do for the Lord and his. So if that's being done, that really takes the individual reading this and saying, I can't really start to pick through the life of my husband or my wife until I pick through the pieces of my own. I will say this too. If you find that you have marital problems and then you will be honest with yourself and go through this passage, you may very well find that half of the remedy, or more or less, but much of the remedy may very well be at your own doorstep. Get that cleaned up and it will help the way that you pray for your your spouse And then you can start to see them begin to change. Have these discussions, go through this passage, understand what it means to both of you, and then find out if both people, a husband and a wife, are absolutely submissive themselves to what is being spoken of here, you will have have healed your marriage. Because things will be in their proper order. Clearly, marriages don't have a problem when they're in their proper order. Now, he's going to change the subject still under the same thing about submissiveness and order and having things be the way they're supposed to be. This still implies that you have your eyes on the Lord, that he's the one who leads you. He's the one who gives you direction. He's the one who guides you because it's not just in the marriage. It's not just in the church. Now it's going to expand a little bit to the family when it comes to the children. And then it's going to expand to how is the believer supposed to conduct themselves in the world around them. So verse six, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now, what's the implication? Mom and dad are submitted to the Lord. They love one another as they're supposed to, as Jesus loves them. And as a result of that, they see their children as an extension of that family. So this is hard for us to really fully understand if if the context is a completely dysfunctional family. This is all under the assumption that the, the people living in that part of Rome leaving their culture behind with its difference of systems between husbands and wives and their roles and responsibilities and how they would react towards their kids. All of that is to be done away with in the Roman culture. Now you are under a different guidance. You are under scriptural guidance now that you are part of the church. So forget about your ridiculous culture. And I mean that today. I don't care what culture you come from. I don't care what part of the world you come from. If you're a believer, that stuff doesn't matter anymore. Can we love things about our culture, our foods, our clothes? I don't know. Take your pick. Sure, those are nebulous things. But if, well, that's how we've always done it in our family. That's how we've always done it in our culture. I don't care. Nor does the scripture. We're held to a different standard. We don't have anything to do with those cultures if they run contrary to the scripture, period. There's just no discussion here. So let me just take this from the husband's point of view. If I'm getting what Paul is putting here and believe that it's being led by the Holy Spirit, which I do, then I'm going to say, as a husband, I love my wife as I love the Lord. And I want to make sure that she sees that. 
and I want her to know that she can walk securely, knowing that I can be the head of the house and the head of the family if I've got my eyes on the Lord. By extension, when I see my kids, I want to give them a pattern that they say, my, my father is an honorable man. Why? Not because of my actions as much, but because I honor the Lord and it dictates my actions. If that's the case, the kids shouldn't have a problem with it. So if they don't and they honor that, then great. We would have kids that should be very much like we are. So a lot of pressure that people will put on themselves. I've got to be the perfect Christian. Now, if you're starting to say things like that, you're not leaning on the Holy Spirit. Let's get back to what we know for sure. We can't do any of the things that we're asked to do without the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Great. That leads us to the place where we honor the Lord, walk with him, love him, and seek him for direction. And by the work of the Holy Spirit, he does those things through us. He opens our eyes to these things. We want to be able to articulate those, not just by our actions, but by what we tell our kids. We want them to be able to honor us and that when they grow old, they want to follow that same pattern. We want them to always have the North Star. We want them to always have a pattern that they can follow and know where it leads. And if that's the case, here's one of the ways that you will notice. Well, look at what he says to the kids. First of all, he addresses them directly. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment that has promise. And so this is the, the in the Ten Commandments, chapter 20 of Exodus, because notice what it says. He quotes directly the second part of that, honor your mother and your father, and that um, it says that it may be well with you and that you may live long upon the earth. You'll have peace. There won't be strife. There won't be problems that will be there. So the operational things. Kids, obey your parents. Parents, give them a reason to be obedient. Walk godly before them, and when they ask you to do something, when your parents ask you to do something, let me address the parents instead. If you're going to tell your kids to do something, have a reason why you ask them to do it. And if you just say, because I said no, that's not going to be helpful. You want to be able to give a reason why, so it doesn't just seem like you're getting them out of your way. If no is the answer, give them a reason why it's no. Help them to understand the reasons behind it. Let them know that it's to their benefit, not just to get them out of your hair. Take the time to minister to your kids. God does it with us. He doesn't just tell us no about a bunch of things. He tells us why it's no, and he tells us why it's yes when we're reading passages like this. So parents, you you do have a part in this. You've got to be honorable that they see honorable things in you to pattern after. So then, and uh, verse 4. So then you, fathers, here's the second part. Don't provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. And this goes right in line with what we just read. So if I'm not provoking them to anger, I'm not making them get to outbursts of things, that means that I'm taking the time to minister to them and to give them all of the details as to why we do what we do and making sure that they have a love for it themselves. And if they have questions, answer their questions. If they want to reason through something, reason through it with them. Because we would want them to do that with their kids. Someday, if the Lord leaves us here long enough, what we would want, and I'll tell you this, as a grandparent, having two little boys and all the rest of it, there is nothing that blesses me more than watching my daughter, who we raised, watching my daughter minister to her little boys and seeing little glimpses of what what it was like when they were growing up, or when she was growing up, and seeing her employ those same things. I love that. There's never a time that if you were to talk to my daughter, and again, I give all the credit to the Lord in this. This isn't about us, my wife and myself, that we have some parenting skills. We were just trying to be as obedient to God's word as we could possibly be. But to this day, my daughter would tell you she didn't watch Beth and I fight. Um, She was always given a reason why yes was yes and no was no. She always saw a consistency in that. She realized she couldn't play one of us against the other. Uh, She would always get a consistent answer out of each of us. And neither my wife nor myself would just pawn her off on the other parent because we didn't want to have to deal with something. And again, it wasn't really a conscious thing. I just chalk it up to it was the leading of the Lord and him being gracious to us and giving us wisdom in parenting at the time. That's all that there is. It's a dependency upon him. So if those things are taking place, husbands and wives loving each other, obvious to the kids, and they're honoring the Lord and he is working in their lives, they're going to be honorable parents 
to whom the children can look and say, I want to be like that when I grow up. And you will see them begin to demonstrate that as they go. So dads, along the way, you don't want to be stirring up your kids to the place of wrath. Now, in Ephesus, again, Roman culture and all the rest, uh, there's just speculation that what Paul would say, these have to be things that were taking place in Ephesus for him to address them quite the way he does. So does this mean that the father was somewhat aloof and harsh, not easy with the kids, was raising kids a little bit of a different task back then? And was it done with obviously the aid of other servants if that was the kind of a household? Kind of hard to say, but it, it gives the impression that the father is somewhat austere and detached and so would do things that would be provocative to the kids. It's completely out of order with what's just been said. Being honorable would mean that you're not provoking your kids. Actually, you're ministering to your kids, which is not a provocation. Is there times when there are disagreements with your children? Absolutely. Do you use it as an opportunity to teach them and to train them up in the admonition of the Lord? Or is it to tear them down and to create wrath and strife and hurt and resentment? Okay, so parents, if we're going to make application, let's pay attention. Verse 4, say it again. And you fathers, do not provoke your children. Notice he doesn't point out the moms because, again, the head of the house. So fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. But here's the opposite. Bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. You have two options. Make them resent you, be harsh and mean, or admonish them to love the Lord as you love him. It's so night and day. And again, each person can read through that and see how they're doing on that. Now, bond servants. So these are the, the servants in the kind of a place where this is, this is what their, if you will, their vocation is. Again, their world is much different than ours. So we know that uh, people could, uh, could indebt themselves to service. Sometimes there were people that were just put directly into slavery. It was their time. But here Paul wants to address the believer in that context. He's not dealing with whether or not it's an acceptable thing. That's not what it is. It just is the world in which they live. They may wish it to be different. It was going to be what it was going to be. And there was no way around it. But how do you conduct yourself in such a place? Now, in much of the world, much of this kind of stuff still takes place. And, you know, what, where there is there a church? Are they you know, are, are there believers in those kinds of cultures? You know, again, take your pick. The world is very big. There's 8 billion people on the planet. But let's just say even if it existed today and you lived in a house, you don't have your own place. You have to live in the house of the people that you serve. So that's kind of the, the situation that's going on here. Be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in sincerity of heart as to Christ. So... Here's one of those places, if your master in this case is not a believer, wouldn't it be nice if they were, but they're not. That doesn't change the fact that whatever your task is, that you do so as unto the Lord, because ultimately at that point, that's who you are serving. And then you would be trusting him. God, may I find favor in this person's eyes, even though they may not know you. And a servant in that place would be praying, hey, God, there would be a great way that this could really improve, reach them. And use me in any way that I can to be a part of that process where you would reach out to them and help them to see their need for it. See, I've worked for some really horrible people and just not nice. They're just very unpleasant people to be around and to work for. Doesn't change my obligation. Now, I had the fortune to be able to change jobs. Most of us do. And if you can change jobs, that's wonderful. Get out from under the situation. The people being written to here didn't have that same opportunity. So they're kind of in that place, servitude. But Paul doesn't say, feel sorry for yourself. He says, serve the Lord in that place. So going on, don't do so just with eye service as men pleasers. Don't just go through the motions. Don't just say it, actually do it. And so not as uh, man pleasers, but rather as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God in uh, or from a place of the heart. You're dedicated to him. And so you seek him. It's a matter of the heart and not just, yeah, yeah, whatever. Say yes, yes. And then as soon as they turn their back, you go do something else. See, we would not do that with the Lord if we genuinely understand things. And it is to him that we are ultimately responsible. And we could even expect him to say, I don't accept that from you. 
So I wouldn't expect you to do that with somebody who's been put in the place that they've been put in. So yeah, there's an obligation to the believer to act in such a way that we do what we're supposed to do in this world with the same amount of dedication that we have as we serve the Lord. Knowing, I'm sorry, rather, verse 7, and with goodwill doing service as the Lord and not as to men. So again, the, the ultimate authority at the end of the day, it's not whether or not your boss may like you. They should, and they would if you were walking with, with, or doing what you're supposed to do as you're walking in obedience to the Lord. He's the one who would empower you to do so. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, verse 8, he will then receive the same from the Lord, whether he is slave or free. So yeah, God's not going to be in the place of always demanding things of us. There is a, an implied blessing to this. And maybe that blessing is nothing material whatsoever. Most of the time people like to make this about material. It's not about that. It is, at the end of the day, you can look in the mirror, if you will, and say, what I've done is pleasing to the Lord, and I know that that's the case. And what there will be is a satisfaction that comes from that and an approval, if you will, that we know that we've, we've pleased the Lord with our service. And that will be known to us through the work of the Holy Spirit or just the satisfaction of knowing it's not a normal thing that I've done, but it is a godly thing that I've done because he's changed my priorities and I've, I've served him as I serve in the place where he has me. So again, we don't know the world of Ephesus in the first century. We haven't the slightest clue what it's like to live in that kind of a culture, most any of us. Unless we've been to parts of the world where servitude happens, it's foreign to us. We do have jobs and we do have obligations here where we interact with people. At the end of the day, are you able to have, again, that satisfaction and looking back and saying, I did this. I was able to get this accomplished because, first of all, God had to open my eyes to it. But then secondly, I had to depend upon him for the strength and the grace in order to make this happen because it wouldn't happen on its own. So finally, verse 9, and so then you also, you masters, maybe there are some who have servants and then you're supposed to also recognize your obligation in this. And so this would go to, if we try to make a modern context to it, this would be the, the business owner here and now. How are they handling their part of it? Business owners or masters in that first century. Do the same things to them. Giving up, threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. He makes no threats. He would look at the person, the most prominent person in Rome and the, the most lowly of, of the servant slave as being one and the same as far as their importance to him. So in our world, boy, there's so much of a class system and there's so much distrust and hatred between classes oftentimes. And now we try to, it's worse because the government loves to pit one group of people against the other. Just realize that no matter where you are in that whole place, whether you're the servant, whether you're the master, just using the terms he's using here, you have to ask at the end of the day, is my life pleasing before the Lord? And as I serve him, Am I serving in the capacity that he's raised me up into? And it is a tall order. We're asked to do some pretty difficult things. I'll be the first to admit it. But at the same time, it's incredibly rewarding to know that God doesn't ask us to do things that he doesn't also equip us to do. So what he's given to us here, just remember going through it, husbands and wives, it starts with how do we work these things through the entire church itself? And that got us to verse 21. Husbands and wives finish out the rest of chapter 5. And so everyone has their role and their responsibility. And any one of them, if they're going to be honest, can look at their roles and responsibilities and say, how am I doing at this? So if they look at their own lives and say, I'm doing as God has asked me to do, great. How are you putting it into practice? And how is it starting to affect the people around you? If you find that there are problems with the people around you, are you committing that to a matter of prayer? So you see the wisdom within the family and then it also extends, how do I deal with these things with my children? How do I deal with things in the workplace if I'm a person that's in that servant kind of a role? Or if I'm the person who owns my business, how is it that I treat my employees and the people who earn a paycheck from me? Do they see me as an honorable person? Do they know if I'm honorable? I'm honorable because I, I, I look to the Lord. Do they know what the source of your, your motivation and power is? Those are all great questions, and you probably have come up with a million other ones.
So I'm sorry if a couple of times, especially towards the guys, I seem somewhat indifferent towards what you think might be difficult. I just love it that God's not concerned with excuses in this because Paul uses just very matter-of-fact language. This is your obligation. This is what you're supposed to do. Wives, this is what's expected of you. Husbands, this is what's expected. Children, here's what's expected. Business, you know, people that work in business, the employer and the employee, God has very specific instruction for you in this verse, or in these verses, rather. And it is up to you to do one of two things, to read it and then apply properly, or to read it and say, I'll get around to that at another, at another time because it makes me uncomfortable. I've watched a lot of people walk away from counseling in these things because it's inconvenient to them or they're so filled with their own pride that they refuse to change. All right, enjoy your misery. I mean, that was why they were in my office in the first place. So if you're going to say, well, that's the way it's still going to be, all right, it's not as though you hadn't been warned and someday God will let you know, hey, you read the passages, you knew what you were supposed to do, but you chose to impose your own will. I've been there and I've done that. Insisting on my own will and the, own, the way I want to do things is always failure. It's rebellion against the Lord. And his instruction here is not difficult, not difficult to understand. It may be difficult because you can't get out of the way and allow God to work the way that he wants to. So again, pride's a huge obstacle in this. Or the idea of I'm not going to do what I'm supposed to do until they start to do their part is partially pride as well. But it's also just stubbornness, and it is a, a way of looking to get out of your obligation until somebody else fulfills theirs. So there's real danger in that. I hope that doesn't sound too harsh, and I hope that some people, maybe if they've heard that, sometimes a good glass of cold water in the face is not a bad thing. I have been in places at times in my life, and I'll say this uh, in closing in this, because I'll make it personal for myself. This is deeply personal to me, and here's how I know. There was a time early on in our marriage, and I was busy doing things. They weren't ungodly things. They were just busy things. And it took me away from the family more than it should have. I wasn't paying attention to it. I wasn't taking care of my first obligation, and that was to minister to my wife and love her like Jesus loved the church. I was, I've never been abandoned by him. I have never been neglected by him. He's never been too busy to give me the time of day. It never got that bad, but it was bad enough where I had some other priorities that I made greater priority than my own family, and my wife had to confront me about it. And it changed our marriage overnight, and it was really, really cool. And the reason why is because I realized I had failed to minister to the person that God had entrusted to me, my wife. He, she was given to me as a gift and she's a stewardship to me in some ways. That, that, that might sound a little too clinical, but it means I'll, I will be having to give an answer for her. How did you take care of my daughter would be a question that I would have been asked, I felt. And at that point, in some ways, I had failed. And I, would, I was determined to not let that ever be the case again. So that's when the, the lights can come on. It would be very easy to get prideful and say, well, who are you to tell me? Well, the scripture has the authority. The Holy Spirit who opens our eyes to the truth of it has the authority also to put the, his finger right in the middle of our heart and say, you're going to answer to him someday. You better get these things straight because the last thing I wanted to do at that point when it was all really revealed to me, I didn't want to stand before God someday and say, you neglected my kid. I don't want to be put in that place. So husbands, big, big responsibility, huge responsibility. Wives, if you see your husband struggling with these kind of things, pray for him like crazy. Let him see who he's supposed to be. Let him know that he is supported as you're doing your part, that you will support him in his part. And then it'll start to find its way into every aspect of your life, your children, your work relationships, or if you're a business owner, all that stuff begins to change when you realize everything that works, works when you are doing what God asks you to do. And you're empowered by him because you have eyes on him. That's how it works. So we'll pick up with the very, very famous weapons, you know, uh, the, the um, well, we all know it. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. So uh, we pick that up next week and uh, we'll be finishing out the book. We'll finish out the book, I think, next week. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Um, and then we'll be moving on, of course, looking through it. We'll get to Philippians and then just work our way through it. I'll, I'll keep on 
just the normal pace of the way that the books are laid out here in the New Testament. Um, we're getting to, shortly, we'll be getting in the Old Testament to some of the books where we may move them to a different time when we go to do them, and I'll be explaining that. Hopefully you're getting a chance to check out both Old and New Testament as we do these. So I um, hope that you're enjoying the studies, and I pray that they're fruitful and that God uses them to minister to you and uh, grow you in your understanding of who he is. As he does with me, so may he do with you. God bless you. Mm-hmm.